Hello. Welcome to the seventh episode of the American Years Revisited podcast. I'm Kate Simpson, coordinator of the American Years Project. Our project is creating space for and recording the many stories and memories of all the people whose lives were intrinsically linked to the American Navy's presence in the Holy Loch by Danoon on the west coast of Scotland. In this episode, Margaret Hubbard and I were lucky enough to speak to Isabel Lindsay, renowned peace activist and Scottish nationalist. Isabel went on her first anti-nuclear march when she was 14 and has long been active in the CND, being part of the original Committee of 100 and the Direct Action Committee. Isabel talks about why she became involved in the CND, the organisation of protests to the American nuclear presence and gives some wonderful anecdotes about being arrested and walking into the American consulate. Could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be involved with the CND? Yes. Uh, Well, I always had an awareness from childhood of nuclear weapons or atomic bombs as we spoke about them at the time because my father had been among British forces going in to Hiroshima uh, after the bomb had been dropped, not immediately after, I'm not exactly sure it would have been probably a a, a few weeks. So we we had objects in the house uh, that there were some photos that they they were army supplied photos. Uh, There was a melted beer bottle that he picked up on the very edge of the city. So I always had an awareness of this as an issue. And uh, I was also quite political and active in other ways. So when CND developed, which of course was principally initially, it was in terms of the Aldermaston demos and it was uh, uh, much of it was South of England based. I did take an interest and I I was still at school. So when I was, um, I think about 16, there was a a Lanarkshire CND group that was started. So I took part in that and I was asked, would I be secretary? And of course that just opened up uh, lots and lots of activity. This was just before the announcement about the Holy Lock. And I think what people often don't appreciate is just how quickly that happened. We now know a lot of the background from uh, government papers that have been published since, but at that time it was quite out of the blue. You know, it was the end of November, I think, and uh, the government, uh, it was Harold Macmillan at the time, made the announcement that. Uh, there was to be this major nuclear base in Scotland, so close to the major centres of population, in three months. <laughs> that was the, the kind of notice that was given. And that was the point at which the Proteus, the, big, the initial big supply ship, uh, would arrive at Danoon in the beginning of March. So, of course, that gave an enormous boost to campaigning to activity, but it all had to get off the ground very, very quickly. Within weeks, or probably a couple of weeks, there was a big demonstration in uh, in Glasgow, uh, Scottish CND, but with the help of the STUC, uh, Iona Community, a number of other organisations uh, helped to organise that. And then there was a march in Danoon itself. But a whole series of activities very quickly developed, of which the folk songwriting was part of that. And it was a small group who who did that, Maurice Blythman, Josh McCree, folk singer, uh, John Max Smith. There, there, there was a group of them who just got together and wrote these songs. And they had a very particular approach I mean, they they did uh, say to me that they did not like the hymn-like protest songs that were predominant in the South, in England. Uh, You know, H-bomb thunder and things like that. That the thing to do was to have a proper Scottish approach. And it was defiance, it was being cheeky, (laughs) it was humour. And, of course, that with... Ding Dong Dollar and the Glasgow Eskimos, all these kinds of songs 
but they were literally songs that they would sit down together, they would compose, uh, I think, nearly all to popular tunes, and then the next day or two, they would try them out in people, <laughs> and next demo, next March, we were, we were singing them. And, of course, the Ding Dong Dollar one was very specific to Danoon, and that was triggered by the divisions within Danoon itself in response to the announcement. Uh, those who saw it as an economic opportunity and those who saw it both as a threat but also on principle, you know, who were opposed to nuclear weapons. And Ding Dong Dollar was, was specifically designed <laughs> to address that split in Danoon. Did you have a lot of contact with um, protesters in Danoon? Was there a was there a was there a CND in Danoon? As far as I can remember, there was not a group at that time. Scottish CND was not large. You know, it was reasonably active, but it was the arrival of Polaris itself which gave the organisation a very big boost. So, as far as I can recall. There wasn't a, a, a Danun CND group. One of the strongest opponents that I remember, you know, and, and met, and we did press conferences together on a number of occasions, was Margaret Robertson of the boat building family at Hunter's Key. And she was a grandmother and uh, she really took a lead and was very outspoken in opposition. But of course, against that, we had a lot of local shopkeepers and taxi drivers and others who saw this as a prospect for the town. And of course, we were just at that point. We weren't into the period of maximum decline for the, the Clyde holiday areas, but it, it had started. The overseas holidays had started. And of course, people were looking at very much a town in decline at that time. And this was seen as a, an opportunity uh, for a number of people, a number of the businesses there. But feeling was, was divided. And um, what happened, I became even more specifically involved because in my role in Lanarkshire CND, I was asked to organise hospitality for a march that was taking place from London to the Holy Loch by, uh, well, it started off as the Direct Action Committee by the time by the time it had reached Scotland, it was the Committee of 100 because the civil disobedience side had developed quite rapidly in England and uh, the Direct Action Committee, the Act of Personnel there, uh, had amalgamated with the Committee of 100 and so I had to organise accommodation for them when they came through Lanarkshire. That included in my own house, my parents' house, because I was just 17, I think, at the time, 16, 17. I remember going to see McNagahy. Of course, there were still many miners' welfares throughout Lanarkshire. And he just said, fine, no trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the, the miners' welfares will put them up anywhere where there is one. And, uh, of course, one has to remember that at that time, although we're now used to the churches being very supportive of the anti-nuclear movement, at that time that was not universally the case. The official position of the churches was not anti-nuclear. There were some ministers who were very supportive, who would offer their church premises, but there were others who were not. And it wasn't till many years later into the 80s that George MacLeod, at long last, <laughs> succeeded <laughs> in getting an anti-nuclear position adopted by the Church of Scotland. And at the same time, the Catholic bishops in Scotland issued a, a quite a firm anti-nuclear letter in, in opposition to nuclear weapons. That was in the 80s. So it was about 20 years after. In the process of meeting the civil disobedience people, I joined them in the last part of their march. I think it was just from Paisley to the Holy Loch. 
I got to know them and there had been a decision to organise a large demonstration committee of 100. This was at the London end, had decided to organise a large civil disobedience demonstration in September at the Holy Lock. And they asked me, would I help? So I spent my summer holidays there just before going to university in October, working and organising that demonstration. And we were given the premises, uh, an office, believe it or not, the ILP, the Independent Labour Party, still existed (laughs) at that time. And uh, they gave us an office in Glasgow to work from, uh, and there was a full-time worker came from London. But of course, before that, in in the the final part of the what was the first sit down, which took place at Whitson at the end of May in 61, we had had a lot of activity running up to that. And that's where the Glasgow Eskimos came in, (laughs) because there were a, a number of activists, most of them were from down south. Uh, and who'd been involved on the direct action civil disobedience side down there. But they came and they went out in their canoes to challenge the submarines and the Proteus. And that's where Captain Lanning uh, of Proteus dismissed them as a crowd of Eskimos. And of course, immediately the folk song writing team (laughs) took hold of that and uh, said, right, the Glasgow Eskimos will gaff that naff called Lanning and will speed on what he blows. So it was very quickly reactive to events. We had to sit down and interestingly, the first response of the police at that time was to allow us to block the pier. We did block the pier. I would say there were probably about maybe... 90 or so of us, but we did completely block the pier for 24 hours because the police made the decision not to arrest anyone at that first uh, civil disobedience demonstration. But there were still soldiers, sailors who had to get back onto the ship and to use the pier. So there were actually at times a number of um, sailors clambering over us <laughs> <laughs> and completely disoriented. I mean, they really, it wasn't that they were hostile as such. I think they simply did not understand what is happening, what is this? And I, I do remember that I was sitting beside a woman, I think in her 80s, a, a Quaker from Yorkshire, I think, who said to me, she said, dear, just smile nicely at them and it will make them feel worse. <laughs> so... But they allowed us to sit there to finish the 24 hours. The hotel across the road, down a little bit, allowed us to use their toilets so they they weren't hostile. (laughs) And uh, so that was the first civil disobedience side uh, there. Uh, Obviously, in between times, this was late May, but in between times, there have been a number of other demonstrations at Dunoon and in the town. And I think opinion had probably started to harden a bit or to polarise, as very often happens. Certain things had started to happen, did get, I think, a bit worse. I mean, that's making a value judgment. (laughs) Um, But it became a bit of a target from the sad prostitutes from Glasgow coming over on the ferry because they saw new opportunities. And the local taxi drivers, of course, it was a a big, big expansion of business for them. So there were certain tensions there, but by and large, although there was obvious hostility directed to the political leaderships, in both countries, we might be critical about senior military figures, but n- not in relation to the ordinary sailors. I think people just realised they're just doing a job as they see it. Yeah. 
one instance where I still couldn't say whether this was genuine or whether it was something, shall we say, on the security side. <laughs> but there was one uh, instance where a few of us were just camped down the road a bit from the, the base. It was just a, a, a smaller weekend protest. And there was a, a well-educated sailor who came down and chatted to us and said he was uncomfortable about nuclear weapons and what was happening. And one of those in the group said, well, look, come back and have a chat. If you're coming into, in this case, it was coming into Hamilton, said, come in and, you know, come for a meal and talk, which he did. You know, we had a long chat about the issues and where people were coming from. Now, I still do not know, uh, obviously, whether this, he seemed very genuine, he seemed aware of the arguments, the, the, the moral dimensions, but of course, it could also have been someone uh, from the security side <laughs> seeking information on background, but it didn't matter. I mean, we weren't concerned, as far as we were concerned, we will not talk to anybody. I just wanted to ask what you thought about why the police didn't break up the protest. Was it because they were aware the media were there as well, or did they just think it was best to hmm. let you get on with it, so to speak? Yes, I know. I'm sure this was a policy decision because it was a very different decision they made in September at the demonstration then. And I'm sure they made a policy decision in Scotland Remember, the Scottish police had never really come across the concept of non-violent civil disobedience before. The whole point about the sit-down, and this was explained to everyone, <laughs> the whole point about the sit-down is that you are not a threat. And I think they made the decision, I'm sure it was at a policy level, that it would be less trouble just to say, just leave them there and don't do anything. They had seen the big demonstrations by that time that had taken place in February in Trafalgar Square in London with about two, 3,000, 4,000 and the second one, I think. The big mass sit-downs and the arrests that had taken place there and all the problems, of course, in, in processing people and <laughs> having to carry them away. <laughs> And I think they decided that that probably was not worth it. Now, what happened over the, the summer is that other protests continued on the civil disobedience side, more specifically direct action side. We were organising this big demonstration for September. We worked on this all summer. We were getting more and more support. Our aim was to try to make this you know, to try to get away from uh, that this was a constant issue of the kind of beatnik issue. <laughs> we, I don't think we had, a, we had uh, at that time quite uh, caught up with what was to happen a few days, a few years later in the United States. We weren't quite flower power <laughs> or that kind of thing. <laughs> but um, there was a lot of pressure there which was not all that successful <laughs> to try to get people look dressed like ordinary citizens, um, you know, don't look as if you're fringe. Uh, we were very keen for the September demonstration to get a lot of people who would be seen as very ordinary Scottish people sitting down, <laughs> not exceptional ones, not just religious ones, uh, but very ordinary people, and we were getting we were getting a lot of support. We had promises that had amounted to about eight hundred of people to wow. to sit down and block the pier. Now, of course, what happened for that September? Uh, I was through the night. Oh well, it was it was um, rather more than that because. Just a couple of weeks before 
in August, about 30 odd of the key leading people, including staff of the Committee of 100, were due up in court for earlier demonstrations and they were imprisoned. Uh, including Bertrand Russell. Now, because of his age, and because of all the fuss, uh, he got out after a couple of weeks, but others, uh, including the other person, Douglas Brewood, who had been organising with me over the summer in Glasgow, were imprisoned. Uh, so, of course, that meant all the, you know, the, the, the staff, the other organisers and leading figures in the, the Committee of Hundred. By, by that stage, er, er, early on, uh, I'd been asked to go on to the Committee of Hundred and, and be one of those. It meant that I was left in charge. <laughs> and there were a number of others who came up from the South but they hadn't been involved in, in the organisation over the, the summer. Anyway, what happened was that we had this tremendous storm on the Saturday. And you, you can imagine <laughs> feelings when we heard the ferries could not get over. One got over and the ferries couldn't get over. And a number of the buses were taking the long road out. But it meant there was a march, uh, a, a fair sized march. In the end, there were close to 400 who were arrested. But of course, we could only do it in stages rather than have everyone sitting down at once and really blocking mm -hmm. uh, the area. Uh, fewer managed to get there, but they, they got there in smaller numbers by cars, by buses coming in. Uh, around the, the, the long road. It was still the large, largest number, I think, that's ever been arrested, you know, in, in Scotland on a, a civil disobedience demonstration of that kind. And it did get a lot of publicity, a lot of coverage, uh, although it was, um, in our eyes, it was so much less than what we had anticipated. We were all taken, everyone was arrested, of course, uh, on that occasion, and we were taken to various uh, police stations. I was de noon. <laughs> we were several to a cell, uh, you, you know, overnight, in fact, until the, uh, the Monday morning when we could uh, appear in court. It was, it was fascinating in that, you know, I was in with about five other women, and I didn't know them. Uh, you know, two of them were from Arran. <laughs> One uh, whom I've met on occasion since was the the daughter of the the man who the, who ran this Kuhanity House School, which was the uh, the experimental free school <laughs> down in uh, Kirkcudbright. There was one of them who was uh, who was from London. But of course, it, it was a we were stuck in there together, so it was a time for getting to know each other, for storytelling. And you know the one silly thing that stays in my mind? I had a belt on <laughs> that had little wooden carvings on it. And one of the women looked at it and she said, you know, when you look at that closely, it's really nice. She said, if you weren't stuck in a prison <laughs> with nothing else to do. You wouldn't look at details like that, would you? <laughs> you know, it's something I've, I've uh, often remembered. It is quite true. If you're perhaps relevant to lockdown, that if you're stuck in a place with nothing else to do, you start to notice things that you wouldn't notice before. And I, I do remember Pat Arrowsmith, the, who was a very well-known direct action campaigner. She had been involved in setting up the direct action committee, very militant uh, over the years, very strong personality. But since I had been left in charge, the two days before I had vetoed the use of canoes on the Saturday of the demonstration. I think I was being a bit too concerned about image that the image has got to be, this is Scottish working class. 
<laughs> sitting down and demonstrating. So we don't want the image of um, uh, of people who are on the fringes of doing things that are a bit mad. So I had vetoed it and I had a great, huge argument with Pat who had come up uh, and said, this is terrible, we must have them. And eventually I said, no, we're not, we're not having them. But remember, I was just 17 at the time. <laughs> but when we were uh, on our, uh, our toilet queue, uh, in Danoon police station, uh, Pat had been in another cell and she came up to me and said, yes, you are quite right. If I tried <laughs> a storm like that, it would have been disastrous. <laughs> now, now, in fact, had it been a good day, she would probably have been right rather than me. And the colourful thing, people do remember the canoes, you know, they do remember these things, but I hadn't wanted it to distract attention from what have been seen as mainstream Scotland. Now, what of course happened after that, I would say that was probably about the peak of activity no, not the peak of anti-nuclear activity, but in terms of activity in Danun. We continued to have demonstration. I, I, I took part in a, a Christmas fast over three days um, there. And, and there were assorted demos, but the things one learns about demonstrations is that you can, for a period, get very big support, especially when it looks as if there's maybe still some fluidity in the situation. But one thing, once things are established, once they're there, it's very hard to sustain activity. Demonstrations, they tend to get smaller. And um, that's especially so of civil disobedience demonstrations because the penalties get bigger. A, a group of... Um, Committee of 100 people just in Scotland, and several of them were students. That was uh, just, uh, it, it, it would have been beginning of 62, I think. And we had a sit in in the US consulate in Glasgow. Very changed day. Well, there's no US consulate in Glasgow now, but very changed days because we just walked in. <laughs> Can you imagine oh. now the security? <laughs> We just walked in and walked upstairs and 20 of us sat down <laughs> and the console was so uh, bemused. Um, <laughs> and something that I probably should not say, but I, I knew his, his wife took a first year politics class uh, University. She was a, a very glamorous Zaza Gabor type, Eastern European of some kind. And she was very friendly with the rest of the girls. You know, she'd come for coffee with us and tell us all kinds of things, including advice <laughs> and contraception. <laughs> And, she, and she, she'd said to me, I remember one time she said to a few of us that, well, the kind of uh, uh, sheaths her husband liked to get, he bought them in boxes from such and such a company and he recommended, <laughs> he recommended them. <laughs> so I sat, sat there looking at this rather bemused middle-aged man, what is happening here? And I thought, well, the things I know about you. <laughs> But of course, would not say. <laughs> um, but at that demonstration, we were uh, 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 arrested. You know, I can say I have been imprisoned in Berlin because at that time there was a small women's romance section there. So uh, the females uh, uh, were in there just uh, Friday till Monday. But in court, the males who had had a previous conviction got, it was either 30 or 60 days. I was the only female with a previous conviction. And I just got, it was a 50 pound fine, which was a lot at that time, but I just got a fine. And I had a few moments in which uh, I thought, should I protest <laughs> and demand equality? <laughs> And then I thought, oh, gosh, that's 
that I'd have to reset the whole of my my first year at uni. And so, and in those moments of hesitation, <laughs> the choice passed. <laughs> This is, of course, what happens, that uh, the more convictions people tend to have, it gets harder for them. And as a result, it's more and more difficult to get people to sustain activity, which is why activity in many of these things tends to take place in waves. This was the only way. Now we've also got climate change, but that takes longer. This was the only way we were, human race was going to destroy civilization as we know it. Much of human and animal life as we know it on the planet. And the two big nuclear powers, uh, US uh, and uh, Soviet Union, were really poised at each other's throats and constantly jumping ahead with more and more technological developments. But it was the utter horror and the knowledge that decisions in this had to be made in moments. If you thought there was going to be an attack on you uh, coming from a, a nuclear missile, you either had to make a decision in a few minutes that you were going to press the button and do the same, even though you didn't know for certain if it was going to happen or it was a mistake or whatever. And just the enormity of it, not just then, but now, and people are so complacent. And, of course, we had the standoff in the the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we were existing in that kind of atmosphere all the time with threats and counter-threats, There was was still a lot of denial around at the time because one of the things that I found in those early days, in the early 60s, in fact, through much of the 60s, was that you still had to educate people as to what nuclear weapons were. I think in the early 60s, people had the, a lot of people had the thing, they're just bigger bombs, you know? A lot of them had lived through the war, these are bigger bombs. They didn't know what radioactivity was, they were just in denial when you try to explain it. Of course not, that's rubbish. But on the other hand, there were other people who did have an understanding of the implications, and the implications were and are so horrific and so much power on a tiny handful of people making that decision. And there is no historical precedent. I mean, there is a historical precedent for terrible and awful brutality, but there is no historical precedent for something that can destroy civilizations by human choice in a matter of moments. You have been listening to Isabel Lindsay and I have been Kate Simpson. Thank you for listening. See you next time.